300 of you and 299 phones. I want to see this. Uh, OK, I'll very quickly bring up Jeffrey Moore. If you've been in an airport bookstore any time in the last 10 years, you know Jeffrey Moore's name. He's a best-selling author of books on strategy and transformation, like Crossing the Chasm, Inside the Tornado, Guerrilla Game. He can probably tell you a couple more. I'm sure that's cool. He's made his life's work about talking about IT and transformation. He's done a great job working with Cisco and Oracle and HP and numerous others. Um, Jeffrey has some very exciting ideas about where the IT stack is going, and he's here to talk about how your life's going to get better, right? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure. What, I, what I'd like to do over the next uh, about 45 minutes is outline where I think this thing is headed. I, I, about 10 years ago, we did a presentation called Orchestrating the Stack. That was trying to see what was going to happen in the last decade around services-oriented architecture. And this is kind of an update of that, moving to the next 10 years, how the rise of business networks and cloud computing is going to morph the stack. And I think the stack itself may become an obsolete metaphor by the end of this decade, but right now it's one that, that we all can work with. So let me kind of get you into this. I, I want to say a couple of words just briefly about the current state of IT, both for the enterprise and the consumer. Then I want to talk about the business forcing functions that I think are the real drivers here. We tend to think about the IT people always tend to think that IT is the driver, but it's not normally the driver. It is the enabler of, of, other, of, of expenditures that are driven by other forces. I want to take a look at what those forces are and then talk about how they're going to shape the IT investment around the cloud in two different kinds of organizations. One we call the complex systems organization, which is largely B2B and the other, the volume operations organization, which is frequently B2C. And then I want to talk about at the end, what are those implications then for this valley and for all the, the vendors that, that we know and love and have known for 30 or 40 years, and a whole bunch of new ones. So current state of IT. The big story, and it was actually somewhere in the last decade that the headline really registered with me is, most of the work that my life in IT has been spent shepherding has been done. The systems of record essentially drove all of the investment of my adult life in IT. Now, by systems of record, I mean all of them. I mean the financial systems, the HR systems, the CRM systems, supply chain systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when I entered the industry in the 70s, we were still writing our own general ledgers. Okay? And, then, and we took it from that time on mainframes through a series of, of transformations which you've seen over and over and over and over again. And basically what we were doing was building out data centers, build, putting in databases, getting the OLTP stuff up, running faster and faster, getting the reporting and analytics and business intelligence in place. And the network was a transport mechanism. It was a way to get material from one place to another, and that was pretty much the deal. And then at the end of the last century, the Y2K phenomenon had this incredible sort of gravitational sucking effect of pulling whatever investment was left in that pipeline into the present. And there was an enormous spike in, in the fortunes of all of the enterprise-oriented vendors. And it was, it was happy times. We call it the time of the great happiness. And, and it was. It was wonderful. But then it was just like, oh my god, the morning after. And so most of the last decade, Enterprises have been digesting that huge uh, uh, sort of banquet that, that, that they took on right at the end of the last century. And so we've had a situation where, particularly from the venture community's perspective, but also from this perspective in this room, enterprise IT has largely been on hold. I mean, the last decade has been consolidating, virtualizing, you know, pulling things, pulling our horns in, sort of getting our act together. Meanwhile, consumer IT has been on fire witness the, the, the place where we are standing right here. Ten years ago, this place didn't exist. Right? Or if it did, it certainly wasn't owned by Google. So what was happening over there? And what was happening in the IT, in consumer IT, is arguably the single most profound change in my adult life, my, my life on this planet, which is that we are in the process of digitizing all of human culture. All symbolic activity that makes us human is becoming digitized. And so, Three things changed everything for consumers. The internet changes everything. You, there is now infinite content. Quentin really regrets this. His friends at Forbes and Fortune or whatever. There's just, the content business has become massively revolutionized. There's no barriers to entry. There's no barriers to exit. Communications many to one. We've seen this. 
The second thing is broadband changes everything. So all of a sudden, video and pictures become the killer app. That, 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 that's what they you know, found on Facebook and MySpace and Hi5 and YouTube and Hulu and all this kind of stuff. Video is the killer app, right? That, that's certainly what John Chambers is, it wants, is, is, is advocating right now, and I happen, I happen to agree with him. It puts all of the media of my life, including books, which has been at the very center of my life, pretty much marginalizes them. Now, maybe with iPads and other things, they will come back in in some interesting way. I, I hope they will. But, but right now, the consumer's world has been dramatically transformed. And then the third thing is mobile. Mobile changes everything. So all of a sudden, the PC, it's the PC in emerging markets. There isn't a laptop in, in an emerging market. There's a mobile device, okay? And, and the iPhone has completely redefined what the mobile device means in, in, in our culture. Uh, just in a way that you, 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 even when you saw it coming, you say it can't happen again, and then it just did. And, and, and you say, well, it, just, it can't be that transformative, and it just is. And so it, it, it's, it's really, really dramatic. So you look at all three of these things, and you go, wow, this is cloud computing, right? I mean, this is the heart of cloud computing. Enterprise is not the heart of cloud computing. The enterprise is going to do something with cloud computing, but it's not where it started, and it's not where its essence lives. Its essence lives here. And you're going to participate in this extension of the cloud. But you need to understand, unlike most IT innovations in my adult life, which started in the enterprise and went to consumer, this innovation started in consumer and is now coming back into the enterprise, which means there's a, there's a level of humility and vulnerability and kind of just openness that you need to have, or you're just going to miss it. If you, if you kind of think that you know better than the cloud, you don't. You don't. This is not your turf. But it's going to become your turf because the economics of it are powerful, but more importantly because of a bunch of business drivers that are forcing IT applications out of that circle that, that, Dave, was, that, that Dave was showing us. So I want to talk just a little bit about these forcing functions because we're right in the, in the center of, of, of this vortex here in Silicon Valley and in the U.S. economy and in the developed economies. Somewhere in the middle, um, beginning of the, the 90s, we began a massive outsourcing campaign that has led to China becoming the leading manufacturing center in the world and India becoming the leading service provider outsourcing uh, center in the world. That was unimaginable to me 15 years ago. I couldn't imagine China's economy be, being a world economy in my lifetime. I couldn't imagine the Berlin Wall coming down. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that was going on. I'm not very good at imagining, pretty clearly. <laughs> but, but the point is, we outsourcing had a massive economic effect. Unlike foreign aid, which largely goes into the wrong pockets for the wrong reasons, outsourcing has changed the global economy permanently and very, very much for the better. But it has led to globalization, which means now all of a sudden our economies are dramatically intertwined and interconnected in ways, frankly, that create risk that we had not anticipated, the most dramatic example being the financial crisis of the last two years. That would not have been possible except for a global economy. So our interconnectedness and our vulnerability have gone increased, have increased dramatically, but so has our mutuality. And if there is a way out of the sort of you know, terrorism and, 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 and just huge human problems that we're in the middle of, mutuality feels to me like a very important asset to be developing. So I'm very happy for this, but it creates a significant economic problem for developed economies, which is commoditization. Now all of a sudden the protections, the things that keep our Business, our profit margins in place, the things that allow us to have nice events in beautiful places like this and give away Nexus phones, that's because we have profit margins that allow us to do that in a developed economy. Well, those profit margins are hard to maintain when all of a sudden a, well, it's 80% of the functionality but 20% of the price, when those offers start coming into your marketplace, your, your ability to sustain price gets dramatically uh, diminished. And so you're, you're saying, I've got to find a way. To, I don't have to sustain price, but I have to sustain margin. The one thing that 30 years of consulting has taught me is the hardest thing to change in a business is your margin model. You must not change your margin model, which means you've got to, you've got to be able to find ways to keep that gap 
between yourself and the commoditizing offer. And that leads to, special, to, to, to this, this powerful interest in differentiation. I must be different enough in order to warrant the price gap that I need in order to make my business model work. And that demand for differentiation forces me to specialize. So now all of a sudden I can no longer afford to do everything because it makes me feel more comfortable. See, now all of a sudden I've got to go, wow, I've got to let other partners do pieces of stuff so that I can specialize because I can't do it all. And part of that partnering activity is now we're back to outsourcing. So, so, and, and this is, an, this, to me, this is an absolutely irrevocable cycle that is going around and around and around, and I just do not see it stopping. This feels to me like a very naturally Darwinian evolutionary cycle, a and it's going to force us all to step up our game, and then when we're done with that, it's going to force us all to step up our game, right? And that's called being alive, right? And it's, it, it doesn't stop, I don't think. When you look at that and you say, well, what is the impact on the businesses that my father grew up and I grew up in, you grew up in? Basically, what we're seeing is the rise of business networks. And this is about a 25-year-old phenomenon. This isn't like new news. But the, the amount of networked relationships, the amount of things that are done outside of the enterprise compared to 25 years ago is dramatic. At the beginning of the last century, there's a guy named R.H. Coase who had a theory called transaction costs. And he said, you will do things inside a company because the transaction costs to get them done are less than doing it with a third party. What the internet has done has dramatically shifted the transaction cost barrier so that getting it done outside the company frequently has lower transaction costs than doing it inside the company, which is why you see the work and the jobs flowing out of the Fortune 500 and into other nations and into smaller enterprises where it can get done more efficiently. And the work will go to wherever it gets done more efficiently. That's the rise of business networks. But we weren't architected. To Dave's point about the building and coming to the building and doing everything in the building, we had that kind of fortress mentality about the enterprise when I was growing up. And this is a very different paradigm. We had a chance to do some very exciting research for oh, oh, a better part of a year with, sponsored by SAP. We went into 45 of their customers, and we interviewed them about the way in which networks was playing out in their business networks. It's a theme called business network transformation that SAP is, you know, really invested heavily in. And what we came, out, came away with is saying, look, there are really two kinds of networks that are forming, and they're very, very different from each other. The collaborative network is a complex systems-oriented network. That means, it, basically, it's relationships among peers. So all of those ovals there are peers. There is one peer that is a peer among peers who kind, of, who kind of organizes it together. It's like a project with a project leader. And that organizer we call the orchestrator. And, and companies that are in this tend to be B2B companies that have thousands or maybe tens of thousands of customers, but they don't have hundreds of thousands. And they certainly don't have millions. And they certainly don't have billions. right? And, and, and this is the classic sort of B2B complex systems model. That's one type of business network that's become much more collaborative than it was. Remember, 30 years ago, R&D was done in Bell Labs. It was done, at, you know, it was done in, in, in the IBM Labs. It was done in HP Labs. Not anymore. Not anymore. Now, more and more of the R&D is actually being done in the ecosystem. It's a much more collaborative world. The same thing goes for sales and support and marketing. It's all being done in a much more networked way. The other type of network is called the coordinated network. And then the coordinated network, it's for high volume operations. We are living at the epicenter of an amazing coordinated network. And it's transaction oriented, not relationship oriented. Despite the fact that Amazon does say, hi, Jeffrey, we don't really have a relationship. Okay? It's a transaction. Okay? It's a very informed transaction, which is kind of interesting. Periodically, if you give a gift book to somebody else, you realize that Amazon all of a sudden becomes, they think you're a chef. It's like, no, I, I just eat. I gave the book to my wife. Send the email to my wife, not to me. Okay. We're, we're, right. we'll, we'll get there. Um, it's an outgrowth of value chains, not project teams. The thing is, the reason it's no longer a value chain is because the interactions and the hopping over of people you know, going from one place to another has become so dramatic. You can no longer think about it as a linear chain, but that's where it started. Okay? And it's, all, it's organized by a concentrator. Now, a concentrator is somebody who's found positional power 
and is the nexus of the market that is being created. Either it's a supply nexus or a demand nexus, and sometimes it's both. Think Walmart and think P&G. But whoever is the concentrator has enormous power and forces, enforces price discipline and efficiency discipline on everybody else in the, in, in the, uh, in the network. And, and over time makes lots and lots and lots of enemies. Because people don't like it. They don't like the power they have. They don't like the fact that they're able to extract monopoly rents. When, when Anil says, do you want to upgrade to 20, uh, Office 2010? It's like, no, no. Because for a long time, Microsoft has been the concentrator in that network. And everybody, everybody resents the concentrator. All their partners resent them. The customers resent them. It's just the way it is. Okay? Walmart is not, the only, as somebody said about Intel once, the only thing worse than having Intel as a customer is not having Intel as a customer, okay? And that's how concentrated work networks work, okay? And, and, and you gotta understand it, that just is. That is the dynamic and that's how they work. And it's, it's a Darwinian selection. Darwin selected for this form of network, okay? So if you look at this in terms of IT, I'm gonna talk about the challenge for collaborative and then I'm gonna talk about the challenge for concentrated. If you look at the challenge for collaborative, you say, look, globalization, I've just talked about, the relationships have gone global. You have to fly in formation across 24-hour time zones. So think about the, those challenges. The burden falls on middle managers. All of that IT spend we did all in my adult life, none of it was good for a middle manager. There's no middle manager in the world that says, gee, I'm feeling unproductive. I'm going to log on to SAP. Like, no. No, nobody would do that, right? It doesn't happen, OK? okay? What they do need to do is they do need to make big decisions in real time about things that are under conditions of ambiguity. And there is, the answers are not in databases. They're not in knowledge bases. They're not even in documents. They're in other people's heads. So I need to talk, the thing that is most fundamental productivity changing device has been this. The Blackberry or the iPhone or whatever, Nexus or whatever it is you're gonna be hanging off of your, of your belt. That's been the biggest change for middle management productivity in my lifetime. Right? So I need to collaborate in real time, and that causes the IT focus to shift from the database to the network, which should just scare the living bejesus out of you because everybody in your organization understands databases and damn few understand networks, okay? It's just like, oh my God, I was not, this is not, this is not the movie I came into, right? This is a new movie. So you look at this movie and you say, well, what's up? We're communicating to innovate, we're collaborating to scale. That's what I'm gonna do in the next decade. This is the, if you're in a complex systems enterprise, I'm trying to predict your future for the decade, okay? The spotlight is gonna fall on middle management productivity. That is your customer. No longer the front line and no longer the guys in the, in the executive suite. No business executive dashboard crap. This is like real time right now, okay? Document-centric collaboration is too slow and cumbersome. I'm sorry to say, but all this stuff about Google Apps and Microsoft Docs, that's the horse in horseless carriage. Okay? This is not about documents because documents are too slow. Okay? This is about messaging. Now, a document is a message, and sometimes it's the fastest way to get the message out. Great. Use it. But it's not about documents. It's about interacting in real time. So user-centric interactive systems emerge. Okay? This is really critical because this is how it gets done. Okay? Social media has shown us the way. We've seen this in our, in our social lives. We are really, really good. At, you know, causing traffic jams in San Francisco using these technologies, right? You can do all kinds of things with this stuff. We needed to do it in the enterprise, but a little bit more securely. So what are we talking about here? Well, this is where we got to look at the consumer side, where we're not the digital natives, we're the digital immigrants, and we're going to try to bring those lessons back into the enterprise. Every one of these things. You say, well, enterprise doesn't need Twitter. Excuse me? I'm going to see, you know, uh, Eric Schmidt this morning. Uh, anybody have a question you want me to ask him? Whew, that was pretty cool. You know, I need to find out who in my corporation knows anything about X, Facebook, right? I'm a product manager. I'm a Neil. I got to get that message out to 27 countries. YouTube, okay? It's, I mean, this stuff works. We know it works. We live with it on the weekends. We just don't get it during the week, right? I want, I, I've got to get to Harry. Who knows where Harry is? Well, his secretary's out. Yeah, I know, his cell phone knows where Harry is. Harry never turns off his cell phone, okay? I could find Harry, right? On-demand conference calls, instant service, you, you get it. Virtual agent, I can actually be through telepresence or halo or whatever technology you're using. 
I can be in multiple time zones from the same place. I ran into John Chambers one morning at 9 o'clock at the Cisco Briefing Center. He'd been there all night long doing teleconferences around the world as, as kind of follow the sun kind of stuff. Search, we can, you, 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 you get it. This is not what we built. There is no Oracle database in the middle of this system. We don't know how to architect this thing, right? You don't have architects that know how to do this. Or if you do, they have pierced body parts and you're not sure you trust them, right? <laughs> But you will have to figure out a way to trust them because this, if, if we don't solve this problem, we don't solve the middle management productivity problem, which means we don't solve the margin problem, which means we don't get to eat, okay? So it's an important problem to solve in a collaborative, in a collaborative network. Some use cases that will largely justify the next round of investment. I can think of a dozen, but here are three. We used to talk about time to market. Now it's team to market because it's time to market spread across a team that's across a gazillion time zones and, 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 and company boundaries. The virtual expert, just the notion that you could have access to Mary Meeker but be in Shanghai and, the, and, and, and two hours later she could be in Moscow and two hours later you know, she can be in London and two hours later in New York, etc. Huge, huge advantage. And then this notion of a line to respond. When the crisis happens, when the Toyota moment happens in your company, can you pull everybody together and say, we've got to get on the same page, we've got to get on the same page now, okay? So there are big, big opportunities. Every one of us can do all three of those things as consumers on the weekend. You can organize a party, you can send evites, you can have, you can have photography, you can have complete film coverage, you can, sp you can spool it out on HDTV, you can do all this stuff at home. You just can't do it at work. Okay. But we ought to be able to do it at work. Okay. Other side of the coin, coordinated networks, high volume networks, you know, what, what are we doing over there? Well, here commoditization is the big forcing function. Now, on the one hand, that's great because commoditization is what volume operations guys live for because it means, it means that I, I get advantages of my scale, I get advantages of my, uh, my reach, but I have to have some amount of margin relief. I don't need a lot of it, but I need some or I'm really hosed, right? And in, in, in developed economies, the lever that I need is consumer preference, which historically was always established through brand advertising on a demographic basis. Not anymore. This is one of the reasons why the ad business is in such desperate shape, because the world has learned to deconstruct ad messages as they listen to them and discard them. They've also learned to TiVo past them and so as a result, many of the ways in which these messages were getting into our heads don't work anymore. So now what's happening? It's a digitized media and it's a digitized marketplace and we have to learn to play the game differently. And we're still sorting it out and it's extremely difficult on the media and advertising brands uh, right now. But it's, it's the, the problem that we're trying to solve is still the same problem, which is I need the consumer to exert an irrational, but nonetheless absolutely predictable preference for my brand, okay? I want them to pick me and that is gonna sustain my margin model, okay? Now that means in, in a digital world, if I can't use brand advertising, what, I, what can I do? Well, the wonderful thing about the digital world is we leave digital footprints everywhere we go and with a bunch of heuristic analysis, you can begin to anticipate who is Jeffrey? Forget about his demographics, what does he do? What does he actually, I know who he thinks he is, I know who he presents himself as, but what does he actually do? So that's called behavioral targeting, right? And the answers are in the databases. This is a database problem. It's just that it's the most unbelievable needle in the haystack problem. It's like a needle in all of Iowa, right? Kind of, kind of problem, right? But, but it's there, the needle is there, and it can be found, God bless for supercomputing, okay? Now finding them and activating them in real time and having the business processes and policies that allow you to act in real time without a human being getting in the loop is kind of new culture for some of us, but not for all of us. Google is a, is a company that grew up with this culture. It didn't have to shed the old culture to get there. Here now what's happening is IT is focused shifting from OLTP, which again was the center point of competition for my entire adult life, to real time analytics closed loop analytics, the kind of things that, 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 that we've seen with search and now, and now we're seeing with, with all other forms of advertising and well beyond that. Uh, uh, fraud detection, uh, threat detection, uh, all kinds of, uh, kinds of things in this world. So you say, okay, I'm an IT, I'm a CIO for a volume ops company. What's my future gonna be like? 
Well, your future is going to be all about correlating to innovate and, co and coordinating to scale. So it's a coordination network, but correlating, not collaborating. You don't act actually ever have to meet a person. You can stay in your room for your entire adult life and be very successful innovating in this model because it's all about the analytics. It's happening at such volume, personal relationships are only a distraction, right? Okay, that's, how, that's how it works. The spotlight falls, it doesn't create much of a social life, but you know, for, for a bunch of people in the world, it's just perfect, okay? Uh, spotlight falls on metadata and analytics. We talked a lot about metadata in the dot-com world. We were absolutely prescient, we just didn't look at the calendar, right? We thought it was gonna happen in the last decade, it's this decade. But metadata and the analytics against metadata are going to be the definitive force that will change the IT investment in the volume ops world. Pre-programmed interactions are too inflexible. We gotta get off of that. Real-time adaptive systems are, are, are the emerge. We've seen this in places like the capital markets and fraud detection, some of these niche apps. We're gonna go all the way across all the volume ops world, probably with more socially. And by socially, I mean we're gonna, we're gonna I think use social networks and, and, and some of the more um, you know, wisdom of crowds kind, kinds of stuff going forward that will let us do this. But again, as you look at, and look at these technologies, all of these technologies are taking the power of supercomputing, what Gwent was referring to, and saying, look, we can extract that and we can apply it to taking volume operations to the next level. That will reduce our costs, which we have to do because of the globalization, but it also, if we can do the analytics right, can increase our margin by making the offer more relevant. This person is in the market for a car. I know they're in the market for a car. I'm gonna give them this offer at the right time. I'm, gonna, I'm going to preempt somebody else getting to them before I do going forward. So lots of IT technology here, and, and, and a little bit more familiar to us, but at a level and a scale and a speed that I think is, 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 will be very unfamiliar to us. Use cases, upselling self-service. Think about it, somebody's online, they're trying to do customer service, what better time to sell them something? There's no competitor anywhere around, you know what they're, 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 they're thinking about, you can, you can make them an offer. New product introductions, Instead of taking them to 25 cities or whatever, what about all these, these, these social groups that, you know, moms clubs and, and various social groups that are in every city, they're all connected by the internet, they're all con connected with each other. Why wouldn't you use them as, as, as sort of incubation points to create s s tipping points to start the, 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 new, the adoption of some new product? Brand marketing, you can do brand marketing, but you gotta do brand marketing in the context of being in a digital environment, not trying to paste it on the top. The brand marketing that we're still encountering now on the internet is brand marketing that it wasn't designed in, it was designed on as an afterthought. And it doesn't yet work right. We'll get it right, but it doesn't work right yet. That's why most of the brand dollars are still going to TV. They're still going to magazines, even though people get that that can't be the future. So I wanna close with, and if there, I think I have a few minutes for Q&A, or but I'd really just about that rather get just your personal comments, uh, but q and is great too. Implications for the IT industry, what's happening to the stack? So the stack, it's no, I'm gonna make the point that this is the whole point of a cloud conference, it's no longer data center centric for all the reasons that, that Dave and, and Quentin have reviewed and I think you'll be reviewing all day. It is now cloud centric, okay? Because you can't do either of the things I said in a data center at an affordable rate. You can't do communication and collaboration at all and I don't think you can do the metadata and analytics at scale, okay? So in that world, this is the stack that I spent 30 years sort of learning and growing up with and meeting the vendors and understanding who were gorillas and who were chimps and who were monkeys and how did these guys work together. And this should look like a very familiar investment stack to most of us in this room. So all I wanna to do to close this talk is to say, how will this stack morph in this decade? So we have assets everywhere on this. I'm making the assumption that you, your organization, has significant asset committed probably on every single line in this stack, okay? So what's gonna change? Well, I don't think consulting services is gonna change. I think the first thing as I'd work down the stack is the desktop will become a more mobile world, okay? And, 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 I, and, and by the way, the laptop is a mobile desktop, right? And basically the desktop is just a laptop with a bigger screen, okay? And, 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 and so, so that's, a, that's a big deal because we didn't architect our systems. I mean, Dave made the point for security, 
But it's not just security. We didn't uh, architect the user interface. We didn't architect the presentation layer for, for, for mobile clients. But mobility is critical to the success of the middle manager in, in the collaborative uh, thing in particular. And for consumer applications, it's critical to access the consumer at the time, particularly with location-based services and things like that, at the time that they're most interceptable. Transaction applications, user-centric applications. All of my life, we built the database, we built the processes, we built the workflows, we built the schema, and then we, at the very end, we said, okay, now we gotta put a user interface on top of this thing, okay? And then, we, and then users had to learn how to use the system, okay? Just flip it, just flip it. Users will flip you if you don't flip it, right? Because they will say, no, no, I'm not gonna learn your system. So now the system design has to start at the other end of the equation, where the power is, which is now with the end user and the consumer. You design my experience, hold my experience constant, and then design back from my experience through the various modes of access. Is he on a mobile? Is he on a laptop? Is he watching television? Is he in his car? To a set of transaction flows which have to adapt to the experience, not the experience adapt to the flow and drive it all the way back into the mainframe and into the ERP system. It can be done, you just don't have people on your staff that know how to do it, okay? But you need them. You need to have the IDEO and the experience designers of the world help you do that, okay? Business intelligence, not very interesting anymore. Why? Because people aren't very interesting anymore. I mean, I love your brain, but it's too small. It's just too small, right? <laughs> Bigger brains, right? We, we need, we, it's not fast enough and it doesn't have enough reach, it doesn't have enough scope because you look at hay as well as needles. The wonderful thing about a computer is you can teach a computer to ignore the haystack and just find the needle, right? You can, it's very hard to do with people. Okay? So you, real time algorithms, and again, we know, we know how to design transaction applications, we know how to do business intelligence. Real time algorithms, well there's some geeks, well the geeks are gonna become more plentiful. Document-based communications? No, no. Session-based communications. The fundamental unit of, co of communication will not be a document, it will be a session. Now the document might be part of the session, it might capture the session after it's over, it might be a substitute for a whole bunch of sessions. But at the end of the day, it's about sessions first, in real time, connecting people in that middle management web who are trying to figure out what the hell do we do now? And the only way they can figure it out is by talking to each other and saying, I don't know, what do you think? I don't know, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, let's try this and see what happens. Okay? That's how decisions get made in that messy middle. Okay? That's where IT can make a huge difference. Application servers, well, yeah, but mobile application servers. You've got app servers, you've got web app servers, you've got database servers, you've got all this kind of stuff. Do you have a mobile app server? Probably not. You don't have to have one, right? That has to be in the architecture. It's, it's, it, and, and the mobile device will not standardize. There will not be a winning mobile device the way there was a winning PC. There are six viable candidates in play right now. I don't see any of the six going away anytime soon. So, and, and you will not be able to dictate to middle managers or upper managers which mobile device they carry. So you have to have something to buffer the enterprise stack from the mobile client. Systems management infrastructure, well, you know, virtual systems management. I mean, this is probably the one that you're most comfortable with. VMware has probably gotten you the furthest of any of these transitions so far. So the fact that VMware would move into the cloud actually doesn't, it's actually reassuring, not actually anxiety producing. But, it's all, but all the systems management vendors, all that stuff that we had before, I mean, it, it, nothing ever really goes away, but it becomes more like the interstate highway system. In my dad's lifetime, the interstate highway system was the internet. It was the most exciting thing this country did, right? And, and now we just drive on it, right? It's still there, but we don't maintain it very well. And, 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 and so as a result, it's not where, where investment's gonna go in the next decade. Database stays the same. Database stays, but underneath it, networks become unified communications where voice and video and data all become and content and the whole the whole Marianne just merges into one online infrastructure going forward kind of a, it, it, by the way if, if you haven't gotten vertigo by now you should become a test pilot because this is the most nauseatingly dizzying thing to think about all the changes if you just literally did this in your in your world I mean you, You'd have to take Dramamine every morning just to get up, right? There's so much change here. And, and, then, and then the final change, mainframe servers and storage, they don't go away, but they smush. They smush. 
okay? They, they smush into some sort of infrastructure services place, right? And, and by the way, you won't be, nobody in this room is gonna be in the 20% that Gardner says isn't gonna have IT assets. You all have plenty of IT assets, but the, the, the portfolio allocation, the investment at the margin, I'll bet damn few of you will build another data center. That's my prediction. I think the number of companies that will build another data center is very small, okay? And diminishing rapidly. You'll find ways to use your existing data centers in interesting ways, but you'll consolidate them. We've been consolidating them for 10 years, okay, going forward. So that's the morphing of the stack. That, this is now the network-centric stack, okay, going forward. Feel, I, I, I would suggest to you it has different winners and losers than the client-server stack in terms of vendors. I think your vendor relationship profile will change. That said, I think the classic canonical vendors that we knew from the last decade will adjust enough to this stack that you will probably maintain your relationships with most of them. But I wouldn't be surprised if you found yourself shifting your weight from relying more on this vendor in the last decade to more on this vendor in the, in the next decade as that, as that goes forward, okay? So this is a big, big change, and it's gonna drive an enormous wave of investment in IT. We didn't, none of this stuff if we bought, right? I mean, this isn't, this isn't like the fourth decade of buying all this stuff. We never bought this stuff, right? This is all new stuff, right? It's a lot of stuff to buy, okay? Which is good for vendors, okay? And because it will have positive impacts on business margins, it's good for businesses. So when the guys at Forrester predict that this next decade is gonna be an, is a, essentially a Eight-year play with the wind in filling the sails of enterprise IT, I agree with them. I agree with them. This is going to be a big decade for enterprise IT. I think in this decade, consumer IT will level off a bit, and enterprise IT will be the big, big, big play. So implications for everyone in this room, and this is the kind of stuff I hope the, the panels will be able to talk about and you're, as you're thinking about stuff. You know, what are we doing about going mobile, going collaborative, going algorithmic, going virtual, going user-centric, going someplace else that we also don't know how to get there. You know, how, do we, how are we gonna make that work? How are we gonna make that work? But I don't see you being able to dodge one bullet on this page, okay? Find the bullet that you, you can say, hey, you know what, not in my company, not on my watch. Maybe not on your watch if you're close to retirement, okay? There's a gold watch close, maybe you're okay, okay? And that always was the dream in certain times in IT. I just let me retire. I don't want to have to go through this one. But, but for most of us, no. These are the bullets that, that we, have to, we have to find a way to transform into ammunition. So some early takeaways. I'm gonna suggest five things that I think in the next maybe 12 months, you may very well launch an initiative to address. Uh, the first one, we, we call in my firm the hyperactive directory, right? You just need to know much more about where people are, what their contact preferences are, how you can get to them. You're, you're trying to extend that web of collaboration to real time, to take the latency out of connecting with each other in your company. Multi-channel communications, meaning I've got to be a multi-device, you know, multi, you know, uh, uh, if so, it's phone or, 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 or IM or Twitter or whatever the heck it is, multi-application, multi-device. Open content management. This is one which is a bit of a challenge for IT, but not too bad. This is a huge challenge for the lawyers and a huge challenge for just our whole thing of what do we put in the public domain and how do we manage our social relationships. You watch a major brand like Tiger Woods trying to sort this thing out for himself to try to figure out what that means. Well, guess what? Toyota's trying to sort it out for themselves, and they're trying to figure out how does that play. I mean, and the problem is we're all wearing hospital gowns. You know, if we turn around, it's not, it's not a good idea, right? So it was, okay, okay. Open content management, big challenge, okay. Uh, consumerized applications, that whole thing about user-centric. I think you guys will start getting into realizing that if we could design user-centric applications, and if we could say, instead of saying the database is the constant and the interface changes, you say, no, 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 no. The user experience is the design that we will maintain in permanence, and everything behind it will change. But what we will not change is the user experience. For the car industry, it's given us a good example here, by the way. I don't think you've ever been in a car where somebody just said, you know what, let's put the accelerator on the left and the brake on the right, just because it would be more fun, right? Okay, no, okay. So the point is when you hold the user experience constant, the technology behind can morph, okay? That's a weird idea for IT, 
particularly because IT invented the idea that users should not really have experiences. Right? Right? Okay. And finally, next generation security, which is going to be terrifying. I just saw a, a, a security, uh, one of those uh, knee in the curve things, 2003, 2004, the malware thing starts going to the moon. And they're calling it the criminalization of the internet. Big organized crime has figured out there's money here, guys. We're going to go get it. Okay? And that's going to cause huge problems for everyone in this room. So there's a lot of stuff on this thing. But these are things, I think, that are genuinely related to the forces we've been discussing that are going to hit you. So just to recap, last slide, current state of IT, consumer tornado adoption. Some folks are having monetization chasms. They're, they're still trying to figure out how to monetize. Uh, enterprise awakening to a new era. New dynamics in business. This, this globalization is a Darwinian forcing function that's forcing us all to adapt. It has evolutionary impact on both global, I mean, complex systems and volume operations. The complex systems people, you've got to invest. The IT it, return on IT investment in this decade is going to come from communication and collaboration. And in volume ops, it's going to come from correlation and coordination. Okay? And so creating the systems that can change those things, that's what that's, that's, what that's about. And finally, implications for the IT industry. In the old days, it was kind of a static paradigm. We could draw these soup cans you know, that we called databases and put them on whiteboards and we could draw little arrows in and out. It was all very stable and there were workflows and life was good. You know? and, and now it's like, oh my god, what's going on? It's so dynamic and actions are under conditions of uncertainty. So all I can say is, as pilots often do when you're flying in, in, in cloudy skies, uh, fa fasten your seatbelt. With that, I want to say thank you very much. Enjoy to have a chance to talk to you. Okay, Jeff. So um, my industry is toast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Google is a coordinated network that nobody really likes. Right. And these guys can do their jobs in a dark room with no personal relationships, but a nauseating level of terror about security. Pretty much, pretty much. You're the futurist, <laughs> not me. But I see this monster Indian bird in your day. <laughs> Might be from me. Anyway, thank you very well, my much. My pleasure. Thank you very um, much. Well, I certainly need a stronger <laughs> beverage than what we can have at this hour, but we are going to have a break uh, lasting till 10.45. It's a good chance to pick up your phone or check out the booths Google's put out for you. We'll come back at 10.45. I'll be here if you want to chat. Great. All right. Well, that's good. <laughs>